All right, good morning, everyone. I think I'll get started. Um, is everyone able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Pam. Perfect, thanks. Um, so my name is Pamela. Um, I'm one of the CCFP EM residents. Um, today I'll be talking about gabapentinoids. I have no conflicts of interest. And before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mangar for his guidance with this presentation um, and feedback, and also Dr. Andrea Sereda, uh, who is a physician who works at the London Intercommunity Health Center and has a focused practice working with people who use drugs. So before I go over the objectives for today's session, um, this presentation was inspired after I saw a patient in urgent care with low back pain who told me that he was get, having trouble getting in touch with his family physician and wanted a refill of his pregabalin. And on history, he screened negative for any kind of substance use disorder and gave me all the appropriate answers. And so I thought, why not? Until I checked Clinical Connect and saw that he had a prescription filled for pregabalin just two days prior and admitted to this after I talked to him about it. So today um, I want to go over gabapentinoids and I'll be covering some of the pharmacology, um, uses of gabapentinoids, misuse, as well as toxicity. So pregabalin and gabapentin are two very commonly prescribed gabapentinoids. There's also a third gabapentinoid called miragabalin, which is not available in Canada. Originally, these drugs were designed as analogs of GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid. And so structurally, as you can see on the image on the screen, um, they're very similar uh, to GABA. The mechanism of action, though, is not fully elucidated, um, and gabapentin and pregabalin, despite their structural similarities to GABA, do not actually have significant effects at the GABA-A or GABA-B receptors. Gabapentinoids are generally thought to be alpha-2 delta ligands, and the alpha-2 delta subunit is a protein in the voltage-activated calcium channel complex. Alpha-2 delta interacts with NMDA receptors and may modulate neuropathic pain. So through its binding, gabapentinoids may interfere with this alpha-2 delta NMDA receptor complex that you see on the right of the screen there, thereby inhibiting excitatory neurotransmitter release, so glutamate, uh, thereby uh, modulating pain um, and thereby having some effects in conditions like epilepsy. I'll now go over to some boring gabapentinoids, uh, which will help when thinking about overdose cases um, with pregabalin and gabapentin. So for the most part, the pharmacokinetics of pregabalin and gabapentin are quite similar. There are differing rates of absorption, and pregabalin is absorbed faster than gabapentin. Peak plasma concentrations of pregabalin are reached at around one hour, and peak plasma concentrations of gabapentin are slower at three to four hours. With respect to oral bioavailability, both are relatively bioavailable. Pregabalin is better with 90% uh, bioavailability, and gabapentin's bioavailability is dose dependent decreasing with higher doses, going from 60% bioavailability at 900 milligrams per day to 33% at 3,600 milligrams per day. Both are relatively small molecules with um, the molecular weight of pregabalin at around 159 grams per mole and gabapentin at around 171 grams per mole. Both also have relatively low volumes of distribution with pregabalin at 0.5 liters per kilo and gabapentin at 0.8 liters per kilogram. Neither drug is particularly protein bound. Pregabalin is not protein bound at all and gabapentin only has 3% protein binding. Neither drug is metabolized and both are renally cleared. The elimination half-life um, is around six hours for both drugs. Now, in animal studies by the drug manufacturers, the 
LD50, so the lethal dose, um, toxicity endpoint was actually not achieved and was quoted at over 5,000 milligrams per kilo in rats and mice, which after using published conversion rules would be over 28 grams, so 28,000 milligrams in a 70 kilo human. But I'm going to make the case that we need to be concerned at super therapeutic doses that are lower than this 28 gram mark. So I want to delve a little bit into the history of gabapentinoids because I think it's somewhat interesting. Um, gabapentin was initially approved by the FDA in 1993 for seizures and was marked, uh, marketed for off-label treatment of pain. Um, subsequently, in 2002, the FDA approved gabapentin for post-herpetic neuralgia. Interestingly, in 2004, the company that makes uh, gabapentin paid a penalty for improper marketing for the off-label uses of gabapentin. And internal documents from the manufacturer revealed that that some of the results of clinical trials examining the off-label use of gabapentin were manipulated to magnify the drug's perceived effectiveness. With pregabalin, uh, pregabalin was approved by the FDA in 2004 for seizures, post-herpetic neuralgia, and diabetic neuropathy. In the following years, uh, it was also approved for fibromyalgia and pain associated with spinal cord injury. Also interestingly, and similar to gabapentin, uh, in 2009, the manufacturers of pregabalin paid a settlement to the US government for misleading and illegal promotion of pregabalin for off-label indications, including um, marketing for the treatment of chronic pain and other neuropathic pains, perioperative pain, and migraine. So in Canada, Gabapentin is approved by Health Canada for the adjunctive management of epilepsy. Pregabalin is approved by Health Canada for use in diabetic peripheral neuropathy, post-herpetic neuralgia, neuropathic pain associated with spinal cord injury, and pain associated with fibromyalgia. But oftentimes, all the different neuropathies are kind of lumped together, and we think of uh, using gabapentinoids as drugs for all sorts of different neuropathic pains, not just the ones previously mentioned. So aside from the conditions already mentioned, whether on-label or off-label, off-label um, uses internationally also include anxiety, use in alcohol disorder, chronic cough, chronic pruritus, restless leg syndrome, and some menopausal symptoms as well. In the US, the use of gabapentinoids tripled between 2002 and 2015, and gabapentin was the 10th most prescribed medication in the US in 2017. So let's take a look briefly at the evidence focusing on the indications for conditions that we might encounter and see in the ER. So this uh, trial was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of pregabalin in patients with sciatica. In this study, um, pregabalin uh, was started at 150 milligrams per day and adjusted to a maximum dose of 600 milligrams per day for up to eight weeks. And the primary outcome uh, was reduction in pain as based on the 10-point pain scale. As you can see on the diagram on the right, and apologies for the quality, um, there was no significant difference between pain scores at the eight week mark. Other outcomes that the study looked at included um, adverse events. And so they found that adverse events were more common in the pregabalin group, and these were grouped adverse effects, including dizziness, malaise, and sweating but they didn't find a difference in serious adverse events, which was defined as hospitalization for a variety of problems, including chest pain, dyspnea, nausea, increased back or leg pain, psychological distress, and suicide attempts. And they didn't find a statistically significant difference in suicidal thoughts either. So what about those patients who present with chronic low back pain? 
So this was a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials for chronic low back pain. And uh, there was minimal improvement uh, in pain with gabapentin and actually no improvement and actually worse um, with pregabalin. However, this review found that there were significant risks of adverse effects similar um, to the prior study mentioned with the number needed to harm um, of seven for dizziness, eight for fatigue, six for difficulties with mentation and six for visual disturbances. These two studies were placebo controlled studies looking at gabapentinoids, one of them uh, gabapentin and one of them pregabalin, uh, looking at their use in acute zoster pain and both were negative trials. Perhaps more importantly um, to us in the ED setting anyway, post-herpetic neuralgia was defined as neuropathic pain persisting for at least three months after acute herpes zoster so these results aren't too relevant to us in the ED setting when we're seeing people who may be presenting quite early. Looking in the literature for other um, uses of gabapentinoids in the acute pain setting, there weren't any studies in the emergency department setting. In the post-operative setting, um, there was a study done looking at single dose oral gabapentin for established acute post-operative pain in adults. And the number needed to treat that they found in this study was 11 patients, which is significantly inferior to commonly used analgesics like acetaminophen and ibuprofen, where the number needed to treat is usually quoted at somewhere along the lines of four to five and two to three respectively. With respect to the major side effects, so adverse effects are often, are usually thought to be dose dependent with the gabapentinoids. And both pregabalin and gabapentin cause dizziness and somnolence with higher rates in pregabalin, so 24% dizziness and 17% somnolence. Um, a Cochrane review in 2017 demonstrated that gabapentin also causes um, some gait disturbances, so ataxia and peripheral edema. Um, in a significant portion of patients as well. However, for more serious adverse event rates, gabapentinoids are um, thought to be similar to placebo based on systematic reviews. I'd just like to talk about misuse now. So historically, gabapentinoids are were considered safe drugs with no misuse potential. And I think this is a commonly held conception amongst physicians as well. But there is evidence of increasing misuse, diversion, and mortality. And perhaps for this reason that you know, we think of these medications as safe, um, these medications are widely prescribed off-label. Gabapentinoids are increasingly prescribed in Canada with 3.9 million prescriptions for gabapentin in Canada back in 2015. So why do people use or misuse gabapentinoids? So it's considered to be a cheap man's high as per the literature. And as you can see from this crowdsourced website, the street price has recently ranged from a dollar per pill to about $10 per pill across Canada. So why do people use it? So when people uh, use gabapentinoids in higher doses than intended or prescribed, they're trying to often achieve anxiolysis, euphoria, or to potentiate the effects of opioids or to relieve withdrawal symptoms from opioids. Interviews done in uh, people with history of heroin use describe pregabalin as being easy to obtain and that pregabalin seems to reinforce the effects of heroin. And talking to Dr. Sereda, this seems to match with local experience as well, with it often being used for the restlessness associated with opioid withdrawal. Anecdotally, there's also some reports that street opioids are sometimes cut with gabapentinoids to help potentiate the effects of the uh, opioids as well. So the first systematic review on this topic uh, was completed in 2016. 
And this review looked at case studies and epidemiological reports from a variety of countries around the world. The majority of case reports that they reviewed involved individuals who had prescriptions for gabapentin, which actually may not reflect real world experience. Um, and these individuals in the included reports took higher dosages than prescribed. The study demonstrated the prevalence of gabapentin misuse and found a prevalence of 1% in the general population, 40 to 65% amongst individuals with prescriptions for these medications, and 15 to 22% within populations of people who misuse opioids. They found that there was a large range of doses used to achieve effects um, and other, um, and the literature has uh, described these ranges from being kind of therapeutic, so under 3,600 milligrams per day of gabapentin to 12,000 or 12 grams, 12,000 milligrams per day. This is similar to real life anecdotal experience in London locally as well. So in London, um, it seems that patients will typically use quite high volumes um, of gabapentinoids, usually orally, and will use, for example, like 20 capsules of gabapentin, either like 100 or 300 milligram capsules, which would be the equivalent of two to six grams of gabapentin. Pregabalin is also used in similarly large quantities, so like 10 capsules at a time, of, for example, the 150 milligram uh, capsules. Um, so that would equate to 1500 milligrams of pregabalin at a time, and often this will be used multiple times a day. In the literature, it's been reported um, that the gabapentinoids can be misused both orally and intravenously, as well as intranasally. Although intravenously, it is harder because of the large quantities required to cook down. Population-based studies have also showed potential for serious harms. So this uh, retrospective cohort study out of Australia looked at the dispensing of pregabalin between 2012 and 2017, as well as intentional poisoning calls and poisoning fatalities. And in Australia, um, pregabalin started to be publicly subsidized in 2013. The dispensing of pregabalin increased by over 73,000 prescriptions per year uh, during the study, and reports of intentional pregabalin poisoning increased by over 50% per year. Similarly, pregabalin-associated deaths increased by almost 60% per year. The study found that it was commonly co-ingested with opioids, benzodiazepines, and other illicit drugs. And risk factors for misuse include uh, younger patients, male patients, and those who are co-prescribed benzodiazepines and opioids. But this isn't just an Australian phenomenon. Between 2013 and 2015, the deaths involving gabapentinoids in the UK, and that was defined as gabapentinoids being mentioned on death certificates, increased by 400%. Within the literature, there seems to be a higher prevalence of misuse with pregabalin compared to gabapentin. A cohort study um, in the general French population um, between 20, 2006 sorry, to 2014 um, described misuse uh, frequency uh, of 12.8% in users of pregabalin and 6.6% in users uh, who use gabapentin. Anecdotally in London as well, um, more people seem to purchase Lyrica or pregabalin um, from the street supply than gabapentin at about an 80 to 20 ratio. This difference in the prevalence of misuse between the two drugs may be explained by the differences in the pharmacokinetics of the two drugs. If you can recall back to the initial slide, um, pregabalin has a much quicker peak and onset of action than gabapentin at one hour compared to three to four hours. Given the increasing misuse, several countries, including the UK and some states in the United States, have put further regulations on gabapentinoids and have put them um, onto controlled schedules. 
So there's certainly a co-play with opioids and the increasing gabapentinoid use is thought to be in part related to the opioid epidemic um, as clinicians search for alternative management strategies for pain. But concomitant use of opioids and gabapentinoids is also associated with an increased odds of opioid related death. So this was an Ontario based study of opioid users from 1997 to 2013. And it demonstrated that co-prescription of opioids and gabapentin significantly increased the odds of opioid related death compared to opioid prescription alone with an odds ratio of 1.99. Dose response analysis of in the study also demonstrated um, that use of moderate to high dose amounts, so defined as over uh, 900 milligrams of um, gabapentin, uh, increased, there was a further increase in the odds of opioid related death by a 60% increase. So with this interplay between opioids and gabapentin, there does seem to be an elevated concentration in gabapentin when consumed with opioids. And there's also a risk of additive respiratory depression when combined with other CNS depressants. So let's talk about overdose and I wanna start with gabapentin. So this was a uh, multi-center case series of gabapentin-only exposures reported to three poison centers in the U.S. between 1998 and 2000. So the study was from quite a while ago now. Um, and there were 20 cases with gabapentin as the sole substance with a wide dose range from just 50 milligrams to 35 grams. There was some overlap in the dose range between those who were symptomatic from their gabapentin overdose and those who are not, with dose ranges from 50 to 6,000 milligrams for those who are asymptomatic. So again, that's up to six grams in this series. And from 1,200 milligrams to 35,000 milligrams in those who were symptomatic. So again, symptomatic in this case series, starting from 1,200 milligrams. So this is a very small case series, um, but unfortunately there is not a lot of data in the literature. The median onset of clinical effects was at two hours with gabapentin overdose with all 20 cases developing um, clinical effects at under five hours. In this study, they did look at um, the use of activated charcoal and it's unclear exactly what effect activated charcoal had. So it was given in about half of the cases and of those cases, less than half of those who weren't symptomatic remained so, and about half of those who weren't symptomatic and were given activated charcoal became symptomatic. Hypotension and tachycardia were also reported in two patients and two patients. Um, but did not require specific treatment. Clinical effects resolved within 10 hours in most patients, uh, in all but two patients actually, and all resolved within 24 hours. No patients were admitted for medical care, um, but were admitted for psychiatric care. So based on this case series, based on the timing of the onset of clinical effects for gabapentin, the authors of the study suggested that a four to six hour observation period would be adequate to assess for the development of toxic effects in most patients. Now let's talk about pregabalin. This was a retrospective review of patients presenting with pregabalin poisoning to two tertiary care toxicology units in Australia from 2014 to 2019. As you can see uh, on this figure, there was an increasing number of presentations per year. So there were a total of 488 presentations and 70% of them were deliberate, deliberate uh, ingestions and the majority of the remainder were recreational exposures. 
And you can see that the proportion of recreational ingestions seems to be increasing as uh, the years go on. So co-ingestion occurred in 88% of these presentations with co-ingestion with sedatives like opioids and benzodiazepines in 79% of cases. And so there's, um, if you just look at the area that's highlighted there, there's a wide variety of co-ingested agents, um, mostly opioids and benzodiazepines, um, but also other um, medications like mirtazapine and baclofen. So in this um, study, the median dose of pregabalin was found to be 1200 milligrams. Again, there was a large range ranging from 75 milligrams to 16, over 16,000 milligrams um, with the interquartile range at 600 to 3000 milligrams. So now I'm going to go over some of the toxic effects of pregabalin. And for all of the following toxic effects that I'm going to talk about, um, these are all basically more frequent um, when there is a co-ingestion based on this study. So in the study, um, coma was defined as a GCS of less than nine and was present in 18% uh, of cases. In those with only pregabalin ingestion, uh, only one out of the 59 presentations though, um, had a GCS of uh, less than nine and this patient was pregabalin naive. So much less frequent in the pregabalin only group compared to the pregabalin with co-ingestion group. With respect to respiratory depression, 11% um, of the 488 patients were intubated and all of the patients who were intubated had co-ingestions. There was no respiratory depression in the pregabalin only group or that required uh, intubation. Hypotension was found in 5% of cases um, involving uh, uh, pregabalin. So this was all 488 cases. And all but one of these cases uh, had a co-ingestion. So just one out of the 5% um, of cases, again, um, were pregabalin only with hypotension. But with this one case, the hypotension actually happened after iatrogenic um, sedation with droperidol for agitation. Similar to other anticonvulsants, um, in overdose, both pregabalin and gabapentin do appear to have proconvulsant properties. In this study with pregabalin, out of the 488 presentations, there were 11 seizures, but only three of these were in the pregabalin only overdoses. And overall, there were a total of um, 59 pregabalin only overdoses. So three out of the 59 uh, had seizures in the pregabalin only group. This study didn't talk about the timing of onset of effects, uh, but the median length of stay was 16.6 .6 hours. So as you can see, um, the effects of pregabalin overdose is worse when there is a co-ingestion with a sedating agent. Otherwise by itself, it is generally a thought to be more benign, but I'll now go over some of the case reports in the literature to give more insight into the management of severe presentations. And again, these severe presentations are, are quite rare. So this was a case report of a, a gentleman who presented following ingestion of 8.4 grams of pregabalin or 8,400 milligrams of pregabalin. This patient presented within one hour of ingestion and was given activated charcoal. At three hours after ingestion, he became unresponsive and was intubated. Pregabalin serum levels at that time were 66 milligrams per liter. He was extubated 26 hours later um, after admission to ICU after his uh, GCS improved without any further specific intervention. This was a case report of an intentional overdose of pregabalin of almost four grams. 
and this patient became obtunded at four hours after ingestion and had a tonic-clonic seizure at eight hours after ingestion, which was successfully treated with a dose of lorazepam. This patient returned to baseline mental status at 13 hours after ingestion. And when they reviewed her blood work, her serum concentration of pregabalin was reported to be 58 milligrams per liter at five hours. So just for some context with this case and the prior case report, with chronic daily doses of pregabalin at 600 milligrams per day, which would be on the high end of the usual therapeutic dosing of pregabalin, um, steady state concentrations are usually just under five milligrams per liter. So with both of these case reports, there was a tenfold increase in the measured serum concentrations of pregabalin compared to that of usual chronic daily dosing. And in the literature, there is a large range of doses resulting in toxic effects, as we've already mentioned. Toxicity is certainly affected by renal function, given that these drugs are renally cleared. And this is something to be cognizant of not only in large dose acute ingestions, but also in chronic therapy, especially in elderly patients. And speaking of renal clearance, um, this is a case report of a young patient who was on long-term hemodialysis therapy with end-stage renal disease, who mistakenly had a dose of pregabalin increased or multiple doses of pregabalin increased. This patient had a history of seizure disorder um, and as mentioned was on hemodialysis and her pregabalin dose was increased from 50 milligrams per day to 225 milligrams per day. She developed myoclonus and tremors around the mouth. And at the time that she became symptomatic, her pregabalin serum concentrations um, were 13 uh, milligrams per liter. So about two to three times what one might expect um, compared to serum levels at usual steady state levels. But given its low molecular weight, low volume of distribution and lack of plasma protein binding, hemodialysis is effective for removal of pregabalin. And so after two runs of hemodialysis, um, the serum concentrations for this patient dropped to two, micro, uh, two milligrams per liter and her symptoms resolved. And so with this case report, the authors concluded that extra hemodialysis is clearly indicated in patients who are already being dialyzed and that consideration to hemodialysis can be given to patients with chronic kidney disease who are not on hemodialysis, um, who are experiencing significant neurological or hemodynamic symptoms. Now let's talk about gabapentin case reports. So death from an acute overdose of gabapentin is extremely rare, um, but there of course is a case report on this. So in this case, um, this patient had no history of renal impairment. This was a case of both gabapentin and clonazepam co-ingestion based on the post-mortem analysis, but this death was attributed to gabapentin because post-mortem analyses uh, demonstrated that clonazepam and its active metabolite were either in the lower or normal therapeutic ranges but the gabapentin uh, concentrations were uh, 88 milligrams per liter. So for context, the usual steady state concentrations of gabapentin are around four to five milligrams per liter when patients are taking 300 to 400 milligrams every eight hours. So with the caveat that I'm not an expert in interpreting post-mortem uh, analyses results, that's about a 20 fold um, increase compared to normal steady state levels. So these next two cases um, emphasize the role of hemodialysis in gabapentinoid toxicity. So we already talked about a case in pregabalin toxicity, um, but these cases are about gabapentin toxicity um, and I especially want to emphasize that these are in patients who are already on dialysis, who likely will not be able to excrete these drugs. So in this first case, 
Um, this patient with end-stage renal disease was found to be somnolent and hypoxic after taking multiple doses of gabapentin uh, without intervening hemodialysis. The first time she presented, she required uh, intubation and ventilatory support, uh, received hemodialysis, and rapidly improved with respect to her clinical status. Her gabapentin level at that time was 22 um, milligrams per liter. And unfortunately, um, there was no report on exactly how much extra gabapentin uh, that she took at that time. But she actually presented three months later again after taking just two extra doses of gabapentin and again um, required ventilatory support um, as well as hemodialysis. This next case um, is a case of gabapentin toxicity in a patient on peritoneal dialysis um, who developed myoclonus um, secondary to gabapentin toxicity. And this patient's symptoms resolved with continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis. This is another case report demonstrating the pro-convulsant uh, effects of gabapentinoids um, in overdose. So in this case report out of Japan, um, this patient was on a cocktail of medications, including gabapentin for epilepsy. And there was an acute ingestion of 13.4 grams of gabapentin in a single dose. This patient presented the following day with frequent simple partial seizures. An EEG demonstrated that the origin of his seizures were different from his usual and seemed to be more diffuse in nature. His gabapentin levels were 17 milligrams per uh, liter. And with respect to the management for this case, uh, the gabapentin was stopped and he was just treated with IV fluids with no other specific management. He returned to the, his pre-overdose state on the following day. So I just wanna pause there and recap what we've learned so far about gabapentinoids and what we've discussed. So in overdose, gabapentinoid uh, overdoses are generally managed supportively. Hypotension may occur, but based on the literature, um, it's generally treated with IV fluids. And in a gabapentinoid only overdose, it would be unusual based on the available literature um, for there to be a need for vasopressors. These patients uh, may require intubation, especially with co-ingestion of a sed sedative agent. Activated charcoal can be considered, keeping in mind that pregabalin is generally rapidly absorbed within an hour and there's not great evidence specifically in gabapentinoids for or against activated charcoal. Hemodialysis can be considered especially in patients who are already on hemodialysis or those with renal compromise um, who are unstable. Seizures uh, can be treated as per the usual algorithm and they're all present um, uh, with, sorry, can be presented as per the usual algorithm. And I'll go into another case of withdrawal seizures uh, later. But with respect to the disposition and observation, the literature seems to suggest considering a four to six hour observation in those who are asymptomatic. And I would perhaps as well contact poison control and seek some expert advice. I will now touch briefly on withdrawal. So the data on withdrawal is also quite limited and limited mostly to case reports. Um, for gabapentin, the dose ranges uh, reported in the literature range from 500 to 8,000 milligrams per day. Gabapentin withdrawal symptoms are very similar to benzodiazepines with agitation, anxiety, diaphoresis, pain, confusion, tremulousness, GI distress, tachycardia, and palpitations. Patients might also have some dysphoria and fatigue. There are case reports of abrupt discontinuation leading to severe agitation and seizures. Um, with respect to the timing of onset of withdrawal symptoms, there is a wide range and these symptoms may begin 
at the 12 hour mark up to the kind of the seven day mark after cessation of use. Most symptoms will occur between 24 to 28 hours with the peak effects at around two to three days following discontinuation. So this is a case report of a young gentleman who self-titrated his gabapentin to 8,000 milligrams per day, so eight grams per day uh, for nine months. This patient ran out of medications and presented with status epilepticus at three days after discontinuation. In terms of the management of his status epilepticus, um, he was given diazepam, lorazepam, was intubated and was given phenobarbital and phenytoin. And his status lasted for 90 minutes, um, but he was just treated with that typical status epilepticus treatment, and then it resolved. There was no other cause found for his seizure. With respect to acute pregabalin withdrawal, um, this case uh, was a case report of sudden and severe agitation, um, diaphoresis, tachycardia, hypertension, tremors, and incontinent diarrhea. And in this case, um, there was thought to be excessive use of both oxycodone and pregabalin, which can certainly muddy the pictures a little bit. But this patient's severe agitation um, was treated with many different medications, including benzodiazepine, opioids, and antipsychotics, as well as gravel with minimal symptom improvement. And because of the lack of improvement with hydromorphone treatment, this case was felt to be more related to his pregabalin withdrawal. In the end, clonidine seemed to help um, this patient's agitation. Um, and the authors posit that given the mechanistic similarities of clonidine to dexmedetomidine, there may be a possible role for clonidine and dexmedetomidine in the severe agitation in uh, pregabalin withdrawal. So with respect to uh, take home messages, um, there is no clear data to show that gabapentinoids are effective for pain management in the emergency department setting. But there's certainly potential for misuse and diversion. And recall that typically with misuse, people are using 10 to 20 capsules at a time, oftentimes multiple times a day. Serious toxicity is rare. Um, and it is typically treated with supportive management. But, and there is a large dose range that results in serious toxicity. The literature does seem to suggest more severe presentations um, with higher doses. But if you think back to the fact that people are using 10 to 20 capsules in order to achieve the euphoria, the anxiolysis, and everything else that they're trying to achieve with gabapentinoid misuse, um, we could certainly see patients presenting with severe toxicity. I hope that you will all be more alert to um, these ingestions, especially when they're co-ingested with sedatives as this seems to magnify the toxic effects of gabapentinoids. With respect to the management, um, consideration can be given to hemodialysis in those on dialysis and those with renal compromise who are unstable. And there is no big for or against for the use of activated charcoal. In reviewing this topic, it was quite interesting to me that gabapentinoids and opioids like OxyContin share a lot of the similar, um, a lot of similarities in their history. For example, with fines for the improper marketing um, with uh, gabapentinoids, this was also seen in OxyContin um, with Purdue. Um, and it's interesting to me that gabapentinoids are often thought of as safe, and this was kind of the what opioids were thought of for a long time. So I think gabapentinoids are still newer drugs compared to opioids, and I suspect that we'll see a lot more research and data coming out in the coming years um, on this topic. And so that concludes my presentation. 
Um, I'll open it up to any questions at this time. Um, thanks for that presentation, Pam. Um, I was just wondering, and I, like, I, I don't know if you looked this up or saw it at any point during your lit review, um, but in terms of prescribing like gabapentin versus like um, Ativan or like another benzo for alcohol withdrawal, um, like, is there one that has less harm than the other? I actually didn't look, um, look up gabapentin for alcohol use disorder. So I can't comment on that, but that's a great question. Um, I just had a question about, you know, given you ch chatted about like opioids and then now um, gabapentinoids for pain control and that sort of thing. It seems like we're sort of getting very limited in terms of options for patients. Like any ideas what else would be an alternative? <laughs> Great question, Callie. Sorry, I think that was Callie. Um, so we are quite limited in options. Um, and certainly there are some indications that I didn't cover that are less relevant to the ED setting, like diabetic peripheral neuropathy, um, where gabapentin you know, has some more evidence and uh, conditions like fibromyalgia. Um, it's interesting um, because you know like the NNT for things like ibuprofen and Tylenol are quite low and they are quite effective but with kind of with gabapentinoids it's just it's much higher and there's not great quality evidence for a lot of conditions that we um, try to throw it at and I think that's what in part that's what makes us throw it at all of these conditions because we just don't have great options with, you know, the emerging harms of opioids, the emerging harms of gabapentinoids, not really too many other great options to suggest for you. All right, thank you. If there are no other questions, I think I'll end the presentation here. Um, please feel free to email me um, if there's any further questions.